The Lord be with you. May you make us more aware of your presence, Lord. Thank you, Bethany. That's a, a prayer I pray we all pray in a song I hope we all walk from this place within our hearts and our minds this morning. I invite you to turn with me now in your copy of Holy Scripture to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1, we'll be reading verses 10 through 17. As we continue asking ourselves, what if, what if this morning we saw giving as worship? Isaiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the teachings of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I've had enough of burnt offerings of ram and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who asked this from your hand? Trample my courts no more. Bringing offerings is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocation. I cannot endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed festivals my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Now, O God, we pray as we are made more aware of your presence, that you speak to us. Your words are the ones we hear and transform us. While whatever words, Lord, I place in the way are quickly forgotten. Holy God, speak to us now. Give us ears to hear, hearts open to receive, hands and feet willing and ready to obey. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So as I mentioned at the beginning of our service, today, uh, the first Sunday in October, is World Communion Sunday. It's a tradition that dates back to 1934 with a Presbyterian pastor who believed that, that if we could celebrate one single Sunday as World Communion Sunday, it might promote Christian unity and ecumenical cooperation as it focuses on the observance of the Eucharist, of communion, the Lord's Supper. And as I was looking forward to this day, as I started thinking about it, I thought about the first time that I can remember ever taking communion. The first time I ever remember witness, witnessing a service of which the Lord's Supper was a part. Now, I'm sure I had seen it on television, and, and like most things with religion on television, it's always some weird caricature, right? It's not the real thing. But I remember the first time I had communion. I hadn't been going to church for very long, so I wasn't really sure what was going on, what was happening. When when I walked in the sanctuary that morning, everything you see was as it usually was, except the table in front of the pulpit was covered with a white linen cloth with its corners almost touching the floor. And there was definitely something underneath that cloth. Now, I wasn't sure what it was. I started wondering all kinds of things. Was the preacher going to preach about death? And was he going to shock us and pull that sheet off and there'd be a cadaver laying on the table? What was, what was it? Uh, were there a stack of new hymnals under that sheet? You see, we still use the old 75 Baptist hymnal, and this was in the 2000s. I thought maybe they were going to snatch that sheet off like it was a showcase showdown on The Price is Right and hear the new hymnals. I didn't know. 
Was there some traveling, small-time religious person hawking relics, uh, uh, trying to pass through town, and, and under that cloth, maybe there were the remains of some old saint with a hard-to-spell and hard-pronounce name. I didn't know. But that cloth and that table had my full attention throughout every first, second, and last stanza we sang. It had my attention all the way through that sermon that was just really a, a dressed-up sales pitch. My imagination was running wild as I just sat in that pew and stared at that, what's underneath that cloth? Now, I never would have imagined that underneath it was a stack of polished metal trays with little shot glasses of grape juice or a few plates of of tiny little white tasteless crackers. Surely, if you have not been blessed by those little white crackers, I mean, when I came here and had communion, I was like, this is the way Baptists are supposed to do it. Not the little white Jesus. Not those little things. Yeah, Jesus. Not the little white little crackers with no taste and no flavor. These things were supposed to symbolize the body and blood of Jesus. It was not what I was expecting. Now, I may have been a bit underwhelmed by what was hiding under the sheet, but there was plenty of ceremony that came with its unveiling. You see, after the preacher's sermon, after he prayed, he proceeded to walk down the steps, stand on one side of the table, while another man, who I assume must have been the chairman of deacons, stood on the other end of the table. And they slowly lifted the corner of that white cloth. And with all the attempted precision of two marines in a graveside ceremony, they folded it ever so gently and placed it on the front pew. It was the first of dozens of times that I'd witnessed the exact same sort of sheet folding at communion in several other churches. Now, what's interesting to me about all of this is that I witnessed this ceremonial folding of the linen dozens of times before I was listening to a historian in college speaking about the various practices and traditions of our faith, particularly as Baptists in Alabama. And I remember him asking if any of us in the room had witnessed this sort of uh, removing and folding of the sheet that covered the elements of communion. And a bunch of hands went up. Oh, yeah, yeah, we do that at our church. And then he said, why do you do it? And there was a response like, oh, well, because, you know, the, the elements are sacred. And so there has to be some symbolism, some sanctimony that goes with it. Someone a little bit more, let's say, out on the fringe said, it's the Shroud of Turin. It represents the grave clothes of Jesus. And when we pull them up and roll them up, we sit them on the side, just like the resurrected Christ did. And then some said, well, it keeps the bread and the juice hidden so it doesn't distract from the sermon. Even as a preacher, I find that offensive. Someone said, well, you know, you got to have some kind of ceremony to make the Lord's Supper more meaningful. And there were all kinds of creative guesses, all kinds of, of, of options for what it might have meant. But he just looked at us and said, no, actually, the reason... You have the sheet over communion. He said, you all won't remember this, but once upon a time we didn't have a thing called air conditioning. And so we had to open the windows of the church. And when you open the windows of the church, you didn't have the little white crackers. You didn't have the little cups of juice. You had one cup and a a loaf of fresh baked bread. And on those summer days when the windows were open and you could smell that bread, guess what else could smell it? The flies and the bugs. And so somebody said, hey, Brother Bill, let's put a sheet over to communion. And they did. That's what it was. Nothing sanctimonious about it at all. It was a matter of practical application. And still to this day, there are churches where preachers and deacons, uh, maybe rightfully so, they go and quietly uh, lift it with shaking and trembling hands. They lift that white linen cloth off of the Lord's supper table fold that sheet and place it ever so gently on the front pew. All because some churches in Alabama had a problem with flies. Now I think this is, is extremely interesting to me because it speaks to the way we tend to think about worship. Which is to say, honestly, we don't often think about worship. About the why that we do what we do. I mean really, why do we stand when we sing? One I have yet to find a good example for. Why do Baptists always leave out the third verse? 
We do. First, second, and last. It can become so habitual that even if something has three verses, we say first, second, and last instead of all. We don't ask these questions about what we do in worship. In fact, if you were to ask some folks, how do you define worship? They'd say 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. It's an hour. Some might say, well, it's the sinning. I mean, singing uh, before preaching. I accidentally said sinning. That's probably a Freudian slip, right? Some will tell you, well, it's the, the song service before the preaching. Or others might say, well, worship is, is like the experience I had on Lookout Mountain. Or that time I was at a youth conference. And that little feeling, one that John Wesley talked about being his heart strangely warmed. And I suppose those could all be ways we talk about worship. But still, what is worship? Why do we do what we do in worship? I think it may help us to understand worship if we understand the words we use for worship, the words translated as worship in the Bible. There are three main ones in Hebrew in the Old Testament translated as worship. There's shachah, which means essentially to prostrate oneself, to lay face down, arms outstretched, in submission and obedience to God. There's abad, which implies service, like waiting on somebody, in service to someone, as if you're a hired man. Then there's chahed, which also implies prostrating oneself in a sense of obedience and submission. In the New Testament, there are words like proskuneo, which can literally be translated kissing forward. It's used oftentimes when someone talks about the way a dog would lick the master's hand at the table. We translate it as worship or prostration, to lay face down in obedience. Words like aturio, which is understood as ministering to someone as if you're a hired worker, hired helper, a therapeo, a word that means to wait on somebody or to relieve them of distress. Did you notice, though, something that all six of those words across two different, content, two different languages, something they all have in common? Did you notice what they didn't say about worship? You see, they're all verbs, action words, words that imply that worship is not a noun, that worship is not a thing that happens to you. This is why it always bothers me when I hear someone complain about a worship service or talk about a church that they used to go to, and they say things like, well, you know, I went there, but I just wasn't getting fed. To me, that's like someone says something like, well, I've been eating donuts and junk food all week, and I had a salad on Saturday. This diet just didn't work. It's the same thing. Worship isn't something that happens to you, nor is it something that you just show up to. It amazes me, really, how, how so often some folks can casually stroll into a sanctuary, find a padded place to park their posterior, and then just sort of bide their time, waiting for the last amen, as if it's all part of a community service program. Maybe it is part of community service. I don't know. It reminds me a lot of this one kid I went to school with, uh, really from elementary school all the way through high school. His name was Jason. Jason, every, every year at awards day, Jason always got an award for perfect attendance. Every year, showed up, got an award for perfect attendance. We all knew they were going to call Jason's name for perfect attendance. But Jason was at best a C student, right? To me, that always said, you know, just showing up is not how you learn. Just showing up is not how education happens. Just showing up and doing the time isn't how it works. And that isn't how worship happens either. These were some of the mistakes that the people of Judah were making around the time of the first prophet Isaiah, the the 8th century. The nation had grown in the past two centuries, and along with that growth came this sense of comfort and prosperity for those with wealth and power, and an ever-growing chasm between them and the poor, the orphans, the widows. The comfortable would make their way to the temple for worship, just going through the motions, offering what they viewed as the minimum requirements for the Lord's favor. I almost see it like they were in a line going up to the temple, and the priest would take their offering and give them a receipt and say, see you next week, see you next week, see you next week, as they went on down. That's what they did. For them, that was worship. 
As long as they showed up and, and, and gave what they thought was enough, it didn't matter what happened to the poor. It didn't matter what happened to the people of the nation. It didn't matter. For them, worship had become little more than the cultural and familial habits of just showing up, going through the motions. They viewed worship as something you did just to check a box, to claim a title, to uphold the status quo. But God, God defined worship quite differently. And the Lord's words to the people through the prophet, when you read them, they're kind of harsh. They're biting. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the bulls of blood or of, uh, in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who asked this from your hand? Trample my courts no more. Bringing offerings is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. Your hands, he says, are full of blood. Not the blood of the sacrifice that they brought, but the blood of those who were ignored and forgotten and died. God had grown tired of the people simply going through the motions their heartless worship, their inability to recognize that ritual for ritual's sake is not what worship is all about. They're worried more, they're worried more about finding the right way to fold the cloth than they are about what the bread and the wine mean. They're worried more about the style of music than they are about the one to whom they sing. They're worried more about what time the service is over and whether or not they can meet the other folks to the Mexican restaurant than they are about what actually happens in the service. They're worried about what the person in the pew beside them is wearing more than they're worried about whether or not that person has had anything to eat this week. In other words, these people are so worried about the ritual, about the practice, about the habit, that they completely miss the point of the whole thing. And how often, how often do we fall prey to the same sinful misunderstanding? I'm putting myself in there too. How often do we fall prey to the same misunderstanding? How often do we come into this room just expecting something to happen to us, for us, rather than coming to offer something to God and for others? How often do we find ourselves worrying about the right song, the right style of music, the length of the announcements, the font in the bulletin, the words on the screen, the length of the sermon, the loudness of the children as we're trying to pray, the clothes people wear, the place is where we sit and where others sit. How often do we worry about these silly things? How often do we count our dollars and cents and write the check out to the penny so we can say that we tithe? while holding so much back from God and one another? How often do we stand silent while others around us sing their praises to God? How often do we check our phones, make grocery lists, pass notes about the preacher or the person in the pew in front of us while others are praying, wishing, hoping, praying for healing, for peace, for love? How often do we let the plate go right on by telling ourselves, church doesn't need my money. Church doesn't need that. God doesn't need my money. I'll give when there's a need. I'll give when I want to. But that need or want never seems to come. How often do we walk out the door on Sunday morning, unchanged from the way we came in because our hearts have been hardened by a culture that tells us there's no one in the world more important than me. And our one-hour interruption on Sunday can't do anything to crack that facade. How often do we miss the voice of God, the calling of Christ, the opportunity God places before us in worship, for service, for giving, because we've ultimately decided that worship is all about me. That worship is something that happens to me. Something that I'm just supposed to show up for and take something away from. This morning, we've worshipped our God. 
We've given our worship to God through the singing of songs, the prayers we've entrusted to God. That's what we do. I find myself in this way, that sometimes the prayer is just a way to bridge from one thing to another, but no. What prayer is, especially in the context of worship, is an invocation of the presence of God and a giving over of ourselves and say, God, we trust you with this. We trust you. We've given of our tithes, our offerings, hopefully from a place of our need and not from a a place of our extra. We've worshipped God through listening for God's words. And perhaps for for many of us in this room, it's a morning like so many others. A morning where we just sort of show up. And and I want you to hear me say that sometimes just showing up is all you can do. Sometimes just being here is the most you can do, and that's more than so many are willing to do. But sometimes we just show up and expect worship to happen to us. But that's not what worship is. Worship is our gift to God. A small fraction of the gift that God deserves. A small part of our time we sacrifice to God, of ourselves, of of who we are. Worship is our gift to God, so, so why would we ever think that there's enough? What if instead of thinking of worship as an hour on Sunday or something that happens to us in that hour, that we believed that worship really was our offering to God? What if we believe that the songs we sing aren't for our entertainment, but for the praising of God? What if we believe our prayers were heard by God and could actually bring about real change in our lives and the lives of others? What if we saw our giving as worship? What if we truly believe that the act of giving some of our time, our efforts, and yes, our money to God was an act of worship? Think of all the other things in life we're willing to give our time, effort, and money to. Social fraternities and sororities, clubs, gym memberships, Netflix accounts, football games, vacation homes, golf memberships, fantasy sport leagues, travel ball, countless other hobbies and habits. We've all come to to be comfortable with claiming some of our time, effort, and money. But what if each one of us began to take just a small step towards reorienting our lives toward the holistic worship of God? Just one small step. None of us are there. None of us ever will be. But if we take one small step, what if we begin this very day in this moment to shift our priorities of our lives away from those things which our culture and our desires would have us believe are most important? towards the one to whom all other things fall eternally short? What if we all, each and every one of us in this room right now, began to reorient our lives so that the worship of God takes precedent over everything else? What if, beginning with this bread and this cup, we begin to completely give ourselves over to Christ and worship and service, to give God our time, our effort, our money, our talents, all that we are. To give Christ everything we are, for Christ gave us everything He is. What if we saw worship as a verb? The very way we live our lives. What would we give to God then? Let's pray together. Holy God, you who are worthy of all that we have and all that we are. Lord, as we come to this time now and we continue to worship, as we worship around your table, as we are reminded of everything you have given to us, help us, God, to begin even now to take steps towards reorienting our lives to you. To not see the life of faith as a list of do's and don'ts. To not see worship as something with which we just go through the motions. But God, help us to see it as the constant giving of ourselves to you. For you are worthy.
more worthy than anything we could ever imagine. So Lord, at this time when we come to be served from your table, we pray that your presence is made all the more real to us and that you bless us as we seek to remember what you've done and live our lives in constant gratitude and thanksgiving. It is in the name of Christ our Lord we pray. Amen.